And welcome, everybody, to Rapid Fire on WXTK 95.1. I'm your host, Toby Leary. This show is sponsored by Vortex Optics and the USCCA. We are really happy to have them both on as partners each and every week. So make sure you check out the great products Vortex Optics makes, as well as the USCCA. You can always go to uscca.co forward slash rapid fire for a very special offer from the USCCA. That's uscca.co forward slash rapid fire. And we are happy to have you guys join us each and every week. This is the special Easter edition. So this show is recorded. Uh, we won't, won't be taking calls today. I know it's uh, much to my chagrin. I apologize for that in advance. I, I love taking calls from everybody um, as we do this show. But my wife said no. So uh, we had to take a week off. And uh, <laughs> and I had to take a, a day off. Let's put it that way. Yes, it is true. I know. Okay, just relax. Just relax. We're going to make, make it right. So uh, the... The point I'm trying to make is uh, I've recorded this show on Saturday for airing on WXDK on Sunday. So we will not be going to the phones today. Uh, but that's the only difference, which is okay. Like, you guys are still going to get a great show. We still got a lot to talk about. It's still crazy out there. There's gun news breaking left and right. And we're going to have just kind of a more relaxed environment today and uh, talk about whatever it is that makes me happy. How's that? Does that sound good to everyone? All right. Good job. I'm glad. All right. And you know what? Even uh, being Easter, we can still talk about guns, which is one of my favorite subjects. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it goes. So, um, <laughs> Anyway, if you have a sense of humor like me, and if you're listening on Easter to this show, I'm just saying you might need to reevaluate life a little bit. Just kidding. I understand the magnetic draw to hearing common sense about firearms and the Second Amendment each and every week. And that's why you join, right? Uh, so hopefully you guys all get to um, at least have some good food and be with friends on this Easter Sunday, which is, by the way, Resurrection Sunday. In my opinion, it is the most important day in all of Christianity because if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, all we have is a cool story and a you know, we have a bunch of uh, nice uh, truisms by a well-intentioned teacher and, you know, religious leader that is A, a false prophet, or B, um, totally nuts. And I think the option C applies that he is who he says he is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So um, those are really the only three options. And I'm not trying to make this a religious show, but it is Easter Sunday. And how am I wrong? There's three possible options. Nobody in my entire existence on planet of Earth has ever been able to come up with a fourth that's reasonable, other than someone actually uh, did come up with a fourth. And I'll tell you what that was but it wasn't reasonable. So he's a liar, a lunatic, or he is who he says he is. He's Lord and Savior. Um, my, my friend said, no, there's a fourth option. I said, okay, what is that? And he said, he is a uh, clergy member who is teaching people how to go on trips like acid trips, but with 
uh, mushrooms and uh, everything he talks about, he experienced just not physically. He just experienced it in a trip and, and uh, he's trying to facilitate that for others. So he's some sort of, uh, he's some sort of grand poobah of the mushroom religion or something. I said, oh, that's interesting, but no. Anyway, you guys are here to listen to uh, talk about guns. I know that. Listen to me drone on about guns. But then again, special Easter edition, we deviate a little bit. And uh, well, interestingly enough, um, for those of you who were here last week and heard my, uh, I read my testimony that I spoke in front of the Colorado legislature, in front of the House Judiciary Committee in Colorado. Um, I, I, I spoke about how, um, you know, along these very same lines, how um, our rights are endowed by our Creator, and just like you couldn't ban Catholics or ban Christians or whatever religion you want to put in there, um, if you couldn't ban them, even if you had the support to pass a bill in the House and the Senate, why couldn't you support that? Why couldn't you pass that? If you're intellectually honest, it's because there are constitutional limitations to your power or to your authority in the House or in the Senate. And if you would acknowledge that because you can't ban Catholics, even if you have the votes to do so, then you must reconsider your position on banning guns. Because guess what? The Second Amendment ends with shall not be infringed. So while they all love to pound the pulpit of no right is absolute, they never acknowledge that there's no limitations on one right that doesn't apply to another right. So in other words, if you're applying certain logic to one particular right, then that same logic would apply to others. So the equivalent of banning AR-15s or high capacity magazines or certain guns that don't meet your testing requirements is equivalent to banning Catholics on the First Amendment side. And I can even make the same argument and say, well, we're not depriving you of your right to freedom of religion because you have other religions to choose from. And that's exactly what they do when it comes to the Second Amendment. They ban they want to ban all semi-automatic rifles and say, we're not infringing on your rights. You have other choices. You can own a single shot H&R topper. You can own a Remington 870 pump action shotgun. You can own a, a Hawa bolt action rifle. You can own a Henry lever action. You just can't have the gun that you want. And I find that incredibly ironic and extremely disingenuous that they will not use the same intellectual honesty and apply it to the, any other right. The same, I've, I've made, I think, this argument for decades that when it comes to licensing of gun owners, uh, you know, we've heard, oh, well, you need a license to drive a car, and that's far less uh, of a bar than owning a gun. Uh, no, actually it isn't. I would, I would disagree with you. Owning a car is almost equivalent to owning a gun as far as the damage that it could cause. And also the amount of people that die every year at the hands of said item. So there are tens of thousands of people that die on our roadways every year in automobile accidents. And yet we make this argument that, oh, if it'll just save one life, wouldn't you be willing to give up your right to keep and bear arms? If it'll just save one life, aren't you willing to ban semi-automatic rifles and high-capacity magazines? And whenever I make the argument, no, just like you aren't willing to give up your car 
because it would save one life. You're saying, I'm not the problem. I'm not the one killing people on the roadways. I don't drive drunk. I don't speed down the wrong side of the road and have head-on collisions with people coming the other way. I don't go on wild, high-speed police chases through neighborhoods and on highways that end up in wrecks and hurting and killing people. So why should I give up my automobile? And I would say, hey, you're starting to get it. You're starting to get what what we've been saying for decades. It's uh, it, the dawn is rising on Marblehead. That's right. It's like, hello, here we go. Breaking news. Somebody is starting to get it. So that's exactly right. Just like you wouldn't give up your car. You wouldn't give up your automobile. You wouldn't give up any of that to because somebody tells you that it would make it safer for people on the roads if you gave your car up. Just like that, I don't want to give up my guns that are in common and ordinary use and are useful for offensive or defensive purposes. Just like the Supreme Court said, any gun that is useful for offensive or defensive purposes and that are in common and ordinary use cannot be banned. So we have a whole group of busybodies out there, like all these gun activist groups like Giffords and Moms Demand and Brady and Bloomberg and fill in the, the blank, right? There's enough of them out there, well-funded, well-organized. Um, groups that are lobbyists and are writing big fat checks to politicians like Michael Day out of, um, you know, uh, whatever, where is he from? Suffolk County, I think. Uh, Michael Day, uh, who is the sponsor of HD 4420, which has merged into H4139. And the the bottom line is these groups are writing fat checks to these people that are doing their bidding and taking their bills and introducing them in state legislatures throughout the country, like Massachusetts, like Colorado, like Illinois, like Washington, like Idaho, like um, Maryland, New York, New Jersey, California. And they're doing everything that they want them to do. and. Here we are, um, you know, fighting for the right that has been well established over 250 years ago or almost 250 years ago. And also um, the the uh, the Supreme Court has reaffirmed that that Heller mandate of text, history and tradition Guns that are in common and ordinary use cannot be banned. But yet, here we are defending our rights. So, with all that being said, we have a constant stream of, of people that are uh, trying to take away a fundamental, an enumerated, a foundational right to keep and bear arms which I might add that that right is not really a right if we must ask permission from government in order to exercise it. It's also not a right if it's not the most sophisticated military equivalent that money can buy as far as bearable arms are concerned, because that is what our government recognized is important to have access to in order to keep tyrants from rising to power or from actually implementing their, their dream of total control of you and I. So anyway couple quick notes uh, of some local news. 
a uh, local jurisdiction refused immigration detainer despite nine counts of indecent assault and battery on a child less than 14 years old. So we had this um, horrible news story uh, of a uh, illegal immigrant who's here with nine counts of indecent assault and battery on a child less than 14. And the local jurisdiction refused an immigration detainer on him. Uh, this is an article on uh, hyannisnews.com, Rob Bastille. And it says that ERO Boston apprehends unlawfully present Guatemalan national charged with sex crimes in Massachusetts. Enforcement and removal operations, ERO Boston apprehended an unlawfully present, which is, I don't know why we got to constantly just change the, the terminology. Illegal aliens, fine. Now it's, the, I guess when they're uh, found guilty or, or they've been doing heinous acts, we're now going to call them unlawfully present. So anyway, this unlawfully present Guatemalan non-citizen who has been charged with a myriad of crimes, including sex crimes against minor victims in Massachusetts, deportation officers from the ERO Boston field office arrested 33-year-old Guatemalan national on March 28th near his residence in Lynn, Mass. This uh, unlawfully present national has been charged uh, with sex crimes against children, said a field office director, Todd M. Lyons. His very presence in our community represents a dire threat to our residents. ERO Boston will continue to prioritize public safety by arresting and removing any such threat to the people of New England. The problem is it's very reactive, is it not? So you're only arresting him after nine counts of indecent assault and battery. How about the best way to prevent this kind of crime is to not let them in the country, not let them in the state, uh, period, full stop. But no, we want open borders. We want decades of control in government by allowing people who shouldn't be here to be, to waltz right in. It's, it's absolutely maddening um, and incredibly disingenuous. And not to mention, it is a dereliction of duty for our public officials because what's the one thing that they raise their hand to do? They swear to uphold the Constitution against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. And how do you do that? Well, if you don't have any filter or fence or conditions on who come, gets to come here, then you can't do that job. And guess what is constitutionally required of our government? It's, believe it or not, there's a few things that it isn't. And one of the things that it isn't is monitoring your social media. One of the things that it isn't, and I know some things change later, on in our constitution, in our country's history, but government mandated schooling of our children. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not against government mandated schooling of our children, but it's not constitutionally required of government, but maintaining and protecting our borders is, they are charged with that. So what happens when people who shouldn't be here come here? and we don't do anything about it. We end up with the messy and nasty results of that. Are there some good people who've come here? Absolutely. The problem is how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? How do you do that? You can't. You give them all a court date and say, appear in two or three years, and some of them skip and don't. And the ones that do are the ones you don't need to worry about. But the ones that don't are the ones you definitely need to worry about. And military age males coming to our borders in droves is a ticking time bomb waiting to happen. Then we have a ruling, and we didn't talk about this much last week, uh, but a ruling in a federal court that I'm not totally in agreement with. But the, the bottom line is I knew it was going to come. And I'm not 
in disagreement with it because of the fact that immigrants are allowed to possess guns now. I'm more in disagreement with it because of the open border policy. So we've always allowed non-immigrant visas and permanent resident aliens to own guns. Now we have this unique situation where illegal aliens that are in our country, oh, what was the terminology by Hyannis News? Uh, unlawfully present. They're unlawfully present and they are now going to be afforded the same rights as you and I as natural born citizens. And I say that is the right decision. I actually agree with this decision by a federal court that allows or says illegal immigrants can carry guns. Why do I say that? Well, I believe that the what the founders say in the Declaration of Independence, they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I've said it many times on this show, you can't preserve life without your ability to defend it. And let's back up. What does it mean to be, uh, to have unalienable or unalienable rights? That means you can't put contingencies on them. You can't put conditions on them. Government cannot attach those rights. They must be absolute. They must extend to everybody on earth or else they're not self-evident. It is not for the preservation of life and it is not endowed by our creator. So if it is, then all of those other things are true and therefore anyone here, would those rights would extend to them as well. You could make the argument, and I think it's a good use of the argument, that because you came here illegally, you broke the law, and therefore you have disqualified yourself because of your breaking of the law from being able to own and possess guns. But that also goes counter, it's counterintuitive to my belief, which is if you punish the criminal, they will be unable to obtain a firearm during whatever punishment phase of the crime that they're going through. And so, in other words, if somebody is doing something bad that involves jail time or a civil uh, fine or whatever, that whole time that they're under the government's uh, purview for whatever the violation is, they won't be able to buy or obtain a firearm. After they've paid their debt to society, in other words, they became a good citizen, they paid their fines, they did their time, they did their community service, they uh, made restitution, then they should be able to, their, their rights should be restored to them. That's my thought. And if they're not restored, then it ain't a right. And if it shouldn't be restored because they're too violent to own and possess a gun, what are they doing out on the street? We have this catch-22, right? Anyway, uh, I'd love to know what you guys think about it. So we're going to have to wait till Tuesday or Wednesday. But uh, that's how I feel. And I'd love to hear how you guys feel about it. Uh, we'll be right back after this. You're listening to Rapid Fire on WXTK special edition on Easter Sunday. We'll be right back. So don't go away. Carrying a firearm for personal protection has never been more popular than it is today. The USCCA can help fortify your home, sharpen your awareness and develop your defensive plan. Go to uscca.co forward slash rapid fire to sign up. 
Your family's safety and security is your responsibility. Go to uscca.co forward slash rapid fire to sign up for a USCCA membership and get special training, legal advice, and legal protection you and your family need. Federal delivers a knockout punch with the leading defensive ammo on the market. Federal Punch Hollow Points are accurate and reliable in all defensive situations. When you need reliability designed to provide a balanced mix of effective penetration and expansion, you need Punch Defensive Ammunition from Federal, the leader in nickel-plated brass ammo with a sealed primer to deliver reliable feeding and ignition. Get Federal Punch Defensive Hollow Point Ammunition here at Cape Gunwork. Vortex offers the very best optics specifically made for shooters with rugged construction designed for extreme environments. Vortex Optics build quality ensures accurate, reliable, and repeatable performance every time you squeeze the trigger. Add fully multi-coated lenses and nitrogen purging and you have a quality optic with an extremely reasonable price tag. That is the Vortex difference. Come into Cape Gunworks to see the full line of Vortex Optics today. And welcome back to Rapid Fire, your weekly show, all things guns, freedom, Second Amendment, and self-defense. And uh, so I know that that argument isn't going to sit well with a lot in the Second Amendment community. Um, But that's how I feel, and that's what I predicted would happen before it happened. I spoke about that on the Grace Curley show uh, when she asked me, you know, what's going to happen with all these illegal aliens? And I said what's going to happen is they're going to be afforded every right that you and I are afforded or else we don't have a bill of rights. Um, but anyway, it came true and, uh, here we are. Uh, it'll be appealed. There's no question about it. It might go up to the, it's definitely going to go to the circuit court of appeals. It may go up to the Supreme court, but you never know. Um, it's it's going to be a very very interesting case worth following so um anyway uh one other interesting bit of news is i've never talked about it but i've been following it a little bit um about how pennsylvania has a ban on homemade firearms which is going to advance to the senate and this is something that our state is doing and i don't agree with it but they're doing it anyway. And we just had last week our second conference committee hearing, which after a big applause to the uh, to the conferees for not hiding behind new uh, hiding behind closed doors and deciding to have this open and in the uh, public space, uh, I I have. I applauded you guys a lot over that. Well, about an hour into last week's hearing, y'all voted to turn around and do it behind closed doors again. I know it's it's unbelievable. It's actually super disingenuous, if you ask me. Um, to and I bet what happened was there was probably people like trying to interject or. You know, they're hearing how the public is feeling about this. And uh, I think uh, that's probably why they, whatever for whatever reason, they actually um, say that they decided to bring it back behind closed doors. Um, it's obviously because they know their constituents don't want this bill passed, period. Nothing, nothing but. And that is our biggest ally, folks, in the Second Amendment community, is that's our biggest weapon, if you will, is the story I just read and talked about before the break about the illegal alien with nine outstanding uh, counts of sexual misconduct on somebody under 14. Uh, And this is being reported throughout the country. This isn't just indicative to Massachusetts. Uh, So they're nervous. The people running for office this November know their job is on the line. Every single person who voted for this bill, whether it's H4139 or the Senate 
uh, version of it, whatever the heck that number was, 2142 or whatever. I can't even remember. That's uh, 2584. That's what it was. Um, whatever, whoever voted for that needs to lose their job this week, this November. Lose it. Hopefully somebody will primary against them and we can vote them out before the general election just by supporting whoever it is they're primarying against. And that would be the best resounding, uh, you know, uh, message that the Second Amendment community could ever speak to the legislature. Now, it's an uphill climb. I get it. We have 600,000 gun owners and 7 million people in Massachusetts. So we are a vast minority. But according to national polls, that one third to 40% of the country is at least sympathetic to the Second Amendment. Well, let me back up. A third of the country is actually a gun owner. Then we have the third of the country that is hostile to gun ownership. Then we have a third of the country that is at least sympathetic to the Second Amendment. They might not believe in not one more inch. They might not believe in shall not be infringed, but they're sympathetic to the Second Amendment, whatever that looks like to them. That's where our biggest growth as a Second Amendment advocate can be. And that's where we can find the common ground with people who know that what's going on in our state, the billions of dollars being spent to house and feed and clothe and, uh, you know, provide essential services to people who ought not to be here because we are a country, we have borders, we should be defending those borders, but we are a right to housing state which I believe is being taken way out of context, that that is more of a uh, intellectual knot tying contest than any type of argument that pro 2A people have ever made for the Second Amendment. Uh, you know, they've extrapolated this right to housing to people who shouldn't be here. They're illegally here. They've violated our country's laws. They've violated our borders and have been uh, allowed to come in and stay and remain, which is insanity. It's totally nuts. They should be uh, sent back from where they came from. Ironically, along those lines, there was a bill introduced in the Senate that, not the state Senate, the U.S. Senate, that would have barred the government, the federal government, from chartering flights for illegal immigrants, illegal aliens, from their country of origin right to America so that they don't have to assemble on our southern border. Basically, the government has been charting flights from whatever country of origin directly into our country in their air, in the airports. And what's amazing is how many times you got to show ID to go to on a trip these days? Do you, do you have to have TSA pre-checked? Do you have to have clear in order to uh, pass the giant screening lines where you're going to have to show ID? You're going to have your eyes scanned, your picture taken, and present ID to a customs or an immigration or a TSA official. And then you're going to have to do it again to get on the plane. But here's people with no ID. And there's signage in airports now to how to proceed if you don't have ID. If you or I show up at the airport without ID, we aren't getting on the plane that day. It's as simple as that. There is no possible way. If you don't have any type of picture ID, you aren't going to your final destination. That's a fact. Well, when it comes to illegal aliens, they get to fly wherever they want to go and they get to do it on the government's dime. And again, I'm not trying to make this a big political show today, but it has Second Amendment implications. And this is how we come and find common ground together. And we primary and we defeat the 
people who are anti-gun this November, this September, when they're being primary, is anyone who supports gun control and supports these illegal uh, immigrants coming into our state and taking our housing, taking our services, kicking people out of their houses, kicking uh, people out of their hotels and feeding and clothing and housing and sheltering people who ought not to be here because they did it wrong. They did it illegally. And all the while telling legal, lawful, peaceful gun owners that you're doing it wrong because you want to own an assault weapon or a gun that's not on the assault weapon, uh, not on the approved weapons roster. Think of how insulting that is to our intellect. And all we got to do is find common ground on these two issues and we can defeat the people who are oath breakers and are uh, violating their oath of office by introducing legislation, supporting legislation, co-sponsoring legislation, and violating their oath of office. I said it three times now uh, by voting for this type of legislation that would infringe upon your Second Amendment rights. Now, I heard something in Colorado that I thought was extremely interesting. And I've never, I'm still ruminating on it, but I haven't been able to really do a deep dive on it. But basically, this is what it said, or, or a guy testifying in front of the Colorado House Judiciary Committee alongside me said that you have by default resigned your position because you are voting along with unconstitutional law. You held up your hand. You pledged an oath. You swore an oath to God, your creator, in front of witnesses to uphold, protect, defend the Constitution, state and federal Constitution against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. And then you, instead of protecting and defending that very Constitution, you introduced, you co-sponsored, you voted for unconstitutional legislation. And by doing so, you have, by default, resigned your position by violating your oath of office. To me, that sounds extremely germane to the conversation. Like that is 100% logical. Who wouldn't demand a resignation of any politician who willingly violates the Constitution? And I've said, I've at least made the connection in the past that our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, our form of government, our American way of life was designed for a religious and a moral people. Founders' words, not mine. It doesn't work otherwise because if you don't, if you're not moral and you're not religious and follow a moral uh, standard or compass or, you know, paradigm, then you'll be able to shred, you know, use the our constitution to your advantage. And we find ourselves in this day and age now seeing this exact same thing happen in government. So a public official who swears that oath of office, but yet then on the other hand, violates that oath of office to introduce unconstitutional legislation has by default, you know, they violated their oath and does that mean they are resigning their position? Because now they they have just violated their oath that they swore to uphold and protect. Obviously, there should be a recall of that politician. But more so than that, we should just say, okay, we accept your tendered resignation effective immediately. Your seat is now open and we will hold a new election for that seat. 
obviously that's never going to happen. But where we have we have something called legislative immunity. So any law that they pass, we can't sue them for it. We can sue the executive branch for the enforcement of unconstitutional legislation. But I would say that standard that I said about that our founders talked about that the constitution, the bill of rights, the, our American society, our American way of life only works for a moral and religious people. The same can be said for our legislature who Madison wrote in the federalist papers that they are the gatekeeper of our right. And if now all of a sudden the script has flipped or the coin has been tossed or um, it's now they're not the gatekeeper, they are the oath breaker and they are, trying to strip us of our rights through legislative action, then frankly, uh, it doesn't work. And we have no recourse other than the ballot box. So we talk with Mark Smith uh, from the Four Boxes Diner about the four boxes. And that's where his the name of his YouTube and uh, Twitter handle comes from. The Four Boxes of American Liberty right? The soap box, being able to publicly say whatever it is you want to say. Uh, the preacher uh, has freedom of religion to preach what he wants to. You can stand on a street corner and declare uh, whatever it is you want. You can go to uh, speak in public. You can your, your voice, we have free speech. That's what the soap box is. And then we have the ballot box where we turn over the government officials. And unfortunately, our legislature has become entrenched. They get embedded with this symbiotic predator-host relationship, uh, like a dug-in tick getting fat and bloated off the system, off the very thing that they swore to uphold and defend and protect us from. They have become the very violator of that very thing. And then we have the, uh, so we got the soapbox, the ballot box, the jury box. So we protect our society by holding people accountable in a, in a legal way, in a lawful way, with morality and with law, the rule of law. And then last, we have the ammo box. The ammo box is the fourth box of protection that the American people have against tyranny, against uh, them raising their, rearing their ugly head again and oppressing the people and coming up with a two-tier justice system, coming up with a uh, gentry and a serf or a gentry and a peasantry. Uh, the the two-tier uh, level of uh, justice is a awful thing to witness. We see it now in American uh, politics, uh, protected classes of people, while others, the hammer comes down on heavy and long and hard. And that, frankly, is why we have the ammo box as one of our protections in the Second Amendment, so that we don't have to fear government tyranny rearing its ugly head ever again. So that might be why politicians are trying extra hard to strip us of the fundamental right to keep and bear arms. Hmm, things that make you go, hmm. They'd love to tell us it's just about hunting and putting food on the table, but we know it's not. More on that after the break. I'm Toby Leary. You're listening to Rapid Fire. Happy Easter, everybody. We will be right back. Carrying a firearm for personal protection has never been more popular than it is today. The USCCA can help fortify your home, sharpen your awareness, and develop your defensive plan. Go to uscca.co forward slash rapid fire to sign up. Your family safety and security is your responsibility. Go to uscca.co forward slash rapid fire to sign up for a USCCA membership and get special training, legal advice, and legal protection you and your family need. 
Federal delivers a knockout punch with the leading defensive ammo on the market. Federal punch hollow points are accurate and reliable in all defensive situations. When you need reliability designed to provide a balanced mix of effective penetration and expansion, you need punch defensive ammunition from Federal, the leader in nickel-plated brass ammo with a sealed primer to deliver reliable feeding and ignition. Get Federal Punch Defensive Hollow Point Ammunition here at Cape Gunworks. Vortex offers the very best optics specifically made for shooters with rugged construction designed for extreme environments. Vortex Optics build quality ensures accurate, reliable, and repeatable performance every time you squeeze the trigger. Add fully multi-coated lenses and nitrogen purging and you have a quality optic with an extremely reasonable price tag. That is the Vortex difference. Come into Cape Gunworks to see the full line of Vortex Optics today. Welcome back to Rapid Fire. I'm your host, Toby Leary. Thank you so much for joining me for the special Easter edition. And I'm going to send you out the door here with a with a hopeful story of government transparency in the in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, yes, I'm being extremely facetious. But as I mentioned earlier on in the show, after promising transparency, Massachusetts Dems move behind closed doors to craft gun control bill. This is an article by Cam Edwards on Bearing Arms. Uh, so you can uh, look it up if you want. I'm going to read this article because it's not very long. Um, so here it goes. The Gun Owners Action League has a detailed history of the games that Massachusetts Democrats have played while crafting a sweeping gun control bill over the past several months. You can vi you can see that on Gun Owners Action League website, goal.org. Go to goal.org. They have a huge detailed section of how they've broken pretty much every uh, process C that they could possibly break. But anyway, um, unfortunately, that list is due for an update after the latest shenanigans in Boston. Just a week after the conference committee trying to hammer out an agreement between the House and Senate's competing gun bills hinted that they'd be keeping their discussions open to the public instead of meeting behind closed doors as they normally do. Goal Executive Director Jim Wallace was pleasantly surprised by the decision to keep last week's meeting open and was hopeful that that would be the case throughout the negotiations. Absolutely, the cleaner the better, and it would actually show maybe that there have to be answerable to the general public, Wallace said, adding that it would actually be interesting to see some deliberation and maybe some debate. Sorry, Jim. After further consideration, the Democrats decided on Wednesday they'd rather cut their deal in the shadows after all. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Um, as soon as lawmakers settled in for their second session and before any bargaining could begin, State Rep. Carlos Gonzalez made a motion to move the talks out of the prying eyes of the public and press. State Senator jo Joan Lovely seconded it, citing threats she and her daughter received from a man in her district several years ago that included references to high-powered firearms. The man was later arrested, has since been released, and lives in another state, Lovely said, but the incidents prompted the Salem Democrat to get a license to carry so she could purchase a firearm to protect my family if needed. You don't say. I thought that isn't what solves the problems. You're saying, Jonah, you saying that more guns is the answer to threats against you and your family? I'm shocked. I never would have seen that coming. Conferees have also received hundreds of emails from folks who are opposed to tightening the state's gun laws, some of which have pretty highly charged language, Lovely said. So you mean to tell me that the people of Massachusetts aren't taking their rights being stripped before their eyes? Sitting down, they're kind of upset about it? There's some highly charged language in there? You don't say. You're kidding that's that's hard to believe. I mean, I thought I thought we'd just sit down and go, oh, I guess so. I guess we'll just have to have to take it again on the chin because we're in Massachusetts. 
<laughs> it's unbelievable. I'm very much in favor of conducting this conference committee in public, Lovely said. But she added, I think it's safer to move the talks behind closed doors. Isn't that ironic? That, you know, that segment, if any of you are Gutfeld fans, when he's like, a sexist would say, well, all I can hear when I hear, I just think it's safer to move the talks behind closed doors. I wish I had a, a cut that would say, a tyrant would say, exactly. And Senate Majority Leader Cynthia Stone Cream offered another reason to shroud the committee's talks in secrecy. This ought to be good. The potential that something lawmakers would say on the thorny topic could be used in a lawsuit down the line. Oh, that is priceless. Priceless. So they're worried about the lawsuit that is inevitably going to come once they vote to violate your right to keep and bear arms. You know, if if I could offer one little piece of advice to the six conferees, I would vote to do this behind closed doors. And when we get behind closed doors, I'd say, hey guys, what do you want to talk about today? Because we sure ain't going to talk about gun control. We should talk about pickleball. We should talk about, you know, uh, our favorite vacation. And we should let the sands of time expire on this bill. If we like our job, and if we like our oath of office that we all took, and we think that the Constitution was put in place by people a whole lot smarter than us, because anything other than that is tyrannical. To think that you're smarter than the founding fathers who formed this country. And by the way, when they signed their name to that Declaration of Independence, they, in some cases, signed their death sentence. They pledged their fortunes and their future to uncertainty. One thing that was certain was pain and suffering lay ahead. And they laid that down as a sacrifice for their own personal comfort, their own personal cash flows, bank accounts, whatever you want to call it, and, and said, hey, the future is more important than, than our personal comfort. And yet now we have people like Joan Lovely and Cynthia Cream who think something we might say could be used against us in a court of law in an inevitable lawsuit that is coming. The lawsuit is coming. I promise you that. There's no question about it. It is coming. So do these lawmakers really think that shutting the public out of their deliberations is going to lead to less consternation and con concern from gun owners? At some point, they're going to emerge with a bill in hand. And I guarantee that if it looks anything like either the House or Senate bill, there'll be more highly charged language from citizens who are opposed to having the right to keep and bear arms turned into a privilege to be doled out by the state. If Lovely was truly threatened by a constituent several years ago, that's absolutely deplorable, and I'm glad that an arrest was made. But she can't have it both ways, declaring that she is very much in favor of holding an open hearing while voting to move the deliberations away from the public's view. And this is my words, not Cam Edwards, I might add, also, while getting a license to carry and then voting to strip you of your fundamental constitutional rights. I suspect that Cream's objection to an open discussion is the real reason why the Democrats on the conference committee decided to do their work behind closed doors. She's afraid that one or more of the members of her caucus would say something that could be used against them when their gun bill is inevitably challenged in court. The two Republicans appointed to serve on the conference committee were the lone votes against moving the deliberations to executive session, and that they, along with the state GOP, called out Democrats for their decision. Senate Minority Leader Bruce Tarr opposed the motion to close the meeting, saying that it would hurt public trust. Yep, that ship has sailed, Bruce. 
Um, that actually sailed when you voted to go along with this stupid bill in the first place. But anyway, um, I digress. The Gloucester Republican said he was sorry to hear what Lovely and her daughter went through calling it clearly inappropriate, but said that it would promote public goodwill for people to be able to witness the negotiations. We will not be coerced. We will conduct business, our business, and we will move forward and we will condemn it in the strongest possible terms, anyone who threatens the safety of any legislator. And I will point out that our names, our identities, our addresses are already known. Closing the conference committee will not change that. And what would you rather? Go out in public and be transparent and say, this is the best bill we could come up with because we honestly believe this is not going to violate you of your rights. And you saw the deliberations of how that happened. You saw the questions we asked. You saw the concerns we had. But instead, you're going to close the doors and magically appear with a bill someday and say, this is it, folks. Here it is. Up or down vote and straight to the governor's desk. Um, my fear is that by closing, uh, we may as well stoke the presence of a vacuum relative to public awareness of what we're doing. We may stoke a kind of distrust that can lead to some of the actions that have been described. You know, I never advocate violence. Um, but I gotta, I'm very concerned that there will come someday a breaking point where the people aren't going to take it anymore. And they're going to say, you know what? Enough's enough. We have the Constitution that's very clear about what you can and can't do. You have constitutional limitations. You can't infringe upon lawful citizens' exercise of the Second Amendment of common and ordinary bearable arms, period, full stop. You've been getting away with it for 30 years, and it's time for that to end. It's time for you to recognize your time is very short. And instead of throwing more spaghetti against the wall and hoping it sticks, hopefully you will understand beyond a shadow of a doubt that your days are numbered in Congress. Uh, Hopefully you will be replaced this legislative session if you're going to vote to go along with this nonsense. That's the way I see it, folks. I'm calling balls and strikes here. And uh, God bless everybody. Happy Easter. I hope you had a have a great Easter with your family. I could go on for another hour about this topic. We didn't even get to the end of that article. But join us Tuesday for 2A Tuesday on the Grace Curley Show. Join us Wednesday for Rapid Fire Radio. Go to rapidfireradio.us and there's more where that came from. God bless. I love you all and I'll see you next time. I'm Toby Leary.